from the University of Notre Dame, I'm Andy Fuller, and these are Notre Dame Stories. We're throwing it back to season one in this episode. In honor of the holiday season, we're replaying my conversation with a Notre Dame astrophysicist who's developed a theory on what the Christmas star may have been. I'm an astrophysicist, so people things people see things in the sky, and I'd make models that explain them. Christmas time, here's this astronomical event that's been recorded, and uh, I decided to just look at it as a scientific question. Grant Matthews is a professor of theoretical astrophysics and cosmology. He's also the director of the Center for Astrophysics. Uh, the other thing is it's it's a it's a one thing the College of Science can do to contribute at Christmas time. That's mm. why I got interested in this. You know, the music department and theater, everybody has something they can do. And I thought, well, College of Science ought to have something to say. So <laughs> this is our contribution to the Christmas spirit. It seems like this is uh, something that involves subject matter that, that gets outside the realm of astrophysics to a degree. When we're talking about ancient religion, we're talking about history. Um, does that make the research unique, or have you had other projects where you've had to pull from other disciplines? Oh, this is unique. I mean, <laughs> it is. It's a combination. But there is uh, some very interesting astronomy around this story. So that's a great starting point. So, so let's start there. You know, Let's start with the, the astronomy and, and describe kind of what you started looking into and, and what you found. Well, you know, if somebody comes to me in any day in astrophysics, oh, we saw something in the sky, you know, you'd want to ask three questions about it. When did it occur? What did it look like? What were its characteristics? And did anybody else see it? There's actually a lot of hints in the, the Gospel of Matthew about what were the properties of this star and... Uh, then uh, when it occurs, there, there, you know, there, there weren't real good records, but there's anecdotal evidence, you know, when did Herod pass away? John the Baptist starts in the 15th year of Tiberius, you know, so you can, you can sort of constrain things. Jesus was about 30 when he started ministry, so you can go back 30 years, plus or minus. There's about a dozen different things that you can pinpoint references uh, to, to set the date. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the second thing is the characteristics, you know. The, the Greek word we've seen is star in the east, uh, ente anatoli, I think is the Greek word, literally means we saw it with its rising. Uh, so if something came up with the sun, that tells us something about it. There's also a peculiar thing about the wise men, you know, they go to see Court of Herod. In fact, nobody else notices this, which sort of tells you it's not a spectacular thing. <laughs> After they leave, they say, and then they saw the star, and they rejoiced exceedingly. It was like there was a second appearance, like maybe something went behind the sun, for example. And then the the third thing is that anybody else see it besides the Magi? Uh, there were Chinese astronomers at the time. That was really where I started because I thought, well, they would have a completely independent way of researching this. And so once you narrow down when it was and sort of its characteristics, you know, something appears, reappears, uh, it sort of narrows it down to two or three things. Now, the Chinese astronomers went back 2,000 years B.C., their court records of everything that came through the sky. Mm. Uh, and there was something in the right time frame in the constellation Aquila that they noted might have been a comet might have been a supernova. I went back, decided to research what that could be. Now, <clears throat> from a research standpoint, uh, we're sort of in a unique period in human history in that uh, we have the tools now to see essentially any great transient event that would have occurred in the galaxy. Uh, the, the ones that would be likely would be a comet or a um, supernova. Mm -hmm. Or a nova, those are the kinds of astronomical events. So I went through NASA databases looking for what it could have been uh, once once the date was fixed by the Chinese astronomers, which was around 4 BC or so. 
there actually there was an event uh, which they were very unclear about. Uh, it, it could have been either a nova, supernova, or a comet. So I went through the archives, and uh, there isn't a fact a comet we know that would have had that appearance at that time. Uh, supernova was an interesting story. There was one supernova in Aquila that was discovered. We can see the expanding supernova remnant and the leftover neutron star that's pulsing at us tells us where it is. And um, when I first started researching this, you can calculate from how fast it's spinning down and how fast it's expanding when did the supernova occur? And it worked out to be about 2,000 years ago. So I thought, oh, yeah, maybe this was it. It was a supernova. But honestly, uh, more recent observations of that object make it a little bit too young. Uh, the third thing is a nova, which is a, a binary system of two stars. One pours matter onto the other, and then intermittently they explode with some sort of regularity. Turns out the brightest Nova in the 20th century, early in the 20th century, was one called Aquila 603. And from how bright it is, uh, uh, which was very bright, uh, you can determine that it was a long time before when its previous eruption, which works out, you can calculate it, although there's uncertainty, about 2,000 years previously. So that really didn't answer the question. Any one of the three could have been the transient that the Chinese astronomers saw. Let me just make sure I, I'm, I'm tracking yeah. uh, with you, though. So, so first thing you did was um, you looked for what time frame are, yeah. are we talking here? And then you looked to kind of the Chinese astronomers to say, did they see something of, of interest yes. uh, or peculiarity in, in that time frame? Then you went to NASA to say, do we have record of something that could have been repeatable going back 2,000 yeah. years? Can we work ba backwards and say, well, here was something that happened 2,000 years ago? And there were, there were three candidates. In the end, uh, then I started researching, well, who were the Magi? And they were probably Zoroastrian priests, uh, which was in Babylonia or Mesopotamia area at that time. And they are more like what we would call astrologers uh, today. But, uh, you know, they had their own view of uh, the heavens as a special place, and they had their own view of a Messiah coming. Hmm. And then um, the question is, what would they be looking for? And they were really looking for locations of the planets. Now, people have come to this conclusion for many years. If there was a comet in the sky, for example, or a nova, in those days, that was a sign of, of some disaster coming. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't really a sign of a, a newborn king. Uh, might be a change but it, of rulership, but it, it wouldn't likely be what would tell the Magi to go to Judea. Now, how did they know it was Judea? It turns out there are writings of a famous ancient astronomer called Ptolemy. They, they associated not just um, constellations with time of year, but also with uh, locations. And it turns out the constellation Aries in the writing of Ptolemy was associated with Judea. Hmm. So if the Magi were looking for something special, they would look for a special event in Aries. Now, there was actually another astronomer named Mike, Michael Molnar at Rutgers, and he actually pointed out that there was a very special alignment of the planets that occurred April 17, 6 BC. Hmm. And if you go back and look at what the symbolism would have been to the Zoroastrians, uh, okay, it was in Aries, so there's something in Judea. There was Jupiter, the moon, Saturn... Uh, the sun, uh, all of those together in Aries at once would speak of a, a ruler and the Saturn would make a kind of giver of life. This was a peculiar alignment in the place where the newborn king would have been, which was in Aries. And uh, there's another part of the story uh, that gets explained by this. Jupiter, if you follow it, is going into what we call retrograde motion. Usually the uh, planets move, you know, sort of in a regular pattern going uh, eastward. 
when uh, when the Earth, because it has a faster orbit, passes one of the outer planets, they appear to go backwards in the sky. Hmm. And actually, in the language of the time, in the Greek, the, when when uh, when it says and the star went before them, that means the star is going in the same direction as the the sky at that time, which is what Jupiter was doing. Until it came to rest in the place where the child was, well, that came to rest was the place in the sky, which was in Aries, which would have meant why they would go to Judea and say, where's the newborn king in Judea? You know, I think the evidence points towards this alignment in Aries, which also is consistent with the idea it wasn't something spectacular. You know, in the court of Herod, no one knew this was going on. Uh, so it wasn't something, whoa, what's this bright thing in the sky? It was, you know, we've seen his star in the east. <laughs> they saw it rising, which, by the way, on this April 17, 6 BC, it rises with the sun in the dawn with all these planets lined up. Mm. And then the next thing is, if that was what signaled to them to start their journey, some months later, which is about how long it would take to get to Babylon, that's when the star uh, Jupiter goes into its retrograde motion and literally comes to rest in the sky in Aries, the place where the child is. So hmm. You mentioned Aries as kind of almost a, uh, a geographical clue for the, uh, the Magi. What other clues would there have been, in other words, um, that would have indicated ruler or, or something like that? Okay, yeah. I, I left out a very important part of the story, <laughs> which in those days, uh, the vernal equinox, the first day of spring, was in Aries. Now it's moved over to Pisces and it's almost in Aquarius because mm. uh, the earth precesses like a top. And so where is the North Pole? Where are the equinoxes? Changes with time. Aries, if you look at the old astrological charts, is at the top of the chart. It was a very special uh, place because that was the bringing of life. That was the dawning of spring. Uh, so that was a special significance that there was a special ruler. Now, as nearly as I can tell the meaning of the other things, Jupiter was the symbol of a ruler. And Jupiter and the sun together made it a very powerful ruler. Jupiter, the sun, and Saturn made it a powerful ruler that was a giver of life. Uh, the moon being there at the same time makes it a very powerful ruler, giver of life that had a special destiny. And then the other planets being there saying, oh, this is even bigger than that. Now, I did a calculation because uh, uh, people always ask, well, doesn't this just happen all the time? And uh, it, we see two or three planets lining up, but to get all of them lined up in the vernal equinox is a very rare thing. Uh, I ran forward about 16,000 years, and I could get the planets to line up again, but they weren't lining up in the vernal equinox. It was somewhere else, hmm. at least in the calculation I did. And I ran it forward a half a million years, and it never lined up like that again in the vernal equinox. Now, someone might do a calculation and show me that I, I got something wrong, but as far as I can tell, this was a very rare alignment. Rare as in uh, unprecedented and, as far as we can tell, not going to happen again? And had a very special sy symbolism to the Magi. Now, it's an interesting story. Hmm. You know, why was this newborn redeemer of mankind, why was that only revealed to the Zoroastrian priests and not to the people of Judea? I mean, I have my own thoughts about that, but, and I'll just say it. Yeah, I mean, please. They do. were they were like the modern astronomers of the time. That today, you know, we look at the sky. We're looking for the truth revealed in the heavens, and uh, in that case, in that time, uh, I believe God honored that uh, sincere attempt by those viewers of the heavens uh, of this pending event. Mm. 
Fascinating. Uh, you've, you've kind of become known for this uh, over the years. And um, well, what's been your, your response to that? I mean, on the one hand, it's, it's understandable, particularly this time of year. But has it, has it taken a life of its own? Well, I don't, I don't think so. Mm. This is, it's an important event, and mm. everyone is interested in that event. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's fun to review the science of it and the, the spiritual and historical significance of it. I don't see this as having a life of its own. It's any more than Christmas has a life of its own. Of course it has a life of its own. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very special time of year. And uh, I'm just happy I can make a small contribution every year to understanding that uh, event. Graham Matthews, thank you very much. My pleasure. (laughs) Notre Dame Stories is produced by the Office of Public Affairs and Communications. I'm your host, Andy Fuller. Our music is by Alex Mansour. 